So distributions and parametric statistics. So a distribution is just some collection of scores, right? Like all the test scores from the class. Um, again, you guys are probably fairly familiar with this. Parametric statistics assume a normal distribution, right? Everyone, again, is probably familiar with the normal distribution. Um, I do want to mention, though, that people get real hung up on normal distributions. Um, we do in our stats class a little bit. Is, is normality violated? What does that mean for our stats? <coughs> um, in some sense, normality will always be violated. And the reason for this is that the normal distribution is just a mathematical abstraction. It's derived from calculus. It never actually exists in the world in the same way that a perfect circle doesn't actually exist in the world. But it's a useful idea idealization, right? Just because an, a, an absolutely perfect circle doesn't exist doesn't mean it's not helpful, for example, to use the diameter of a bike tire to figure out how far you went or something like that. Um, it's close enough and it approximates it. And in general, we like our variables and their distributions to approximate normal. Um, but in general, parametric statistics are pretty robust to violations of that as well. So it's not totally necessary, but you should be aware, and you'll hear that, that they assume a normal distribution. Um, but even if your data end up being fairly non-normal, depending on how bad the violation is, it may not matter. So this is the normal distribution. The reason why it's so helpful is because, well, you, you guys it's not the best picture. It looks something like this. It's a bell curve. Um, the reason why it's so helpful to use this abstraction is that we know where things lie in the distribution. For example, we know that at the far tail up at this end, you've got 2% you know, of scores above some value. We know that below that, you have 98% of the other scores. And this is what allows us to make a lot of the inferences that we're going to make with inferential statistics. So it's an assumption. It's an approximation. It allows us to make inferences that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Or at least it would be incredibly complicated to do otherwise. You need calculus to derive these distributions, all this other stuff. Um, so it's sort of like a, a hedge, right? It helps us out. It's a productive assumption, but it's never exactly going to be true. Make sense? All right. So now we finally get into actual statistics. So descriptive statistics, it's pretty straightforward. Um, mathematicians and scientists are very logical and reasonable and boring. Um, descriptive statistics are just statistics that describe distributions, right? Really straightforward. Um, exactly what it says it is. Basically, the, the goal of descriptive statistics is to take, say, some huge list of numbers and summarize it so it's easily digestible. It's really hard to look at 100 test scores and know a whole lot about what's going on. It's a lot easier to look at the mean of those test scores, right? These are descriptive statistics. They help us describe distributions. Um, there's two major kinds that we deal with. There's a lot more, but there's two major ones that we deal with um, in social sciences especially. The first is measures of central tendency. Basically, what's the sort of representative element from the sample? Um, there's different ways you can measure this. One is the mean, which is the average of a sample. Notice here I'm starting to use the notation. You've got x bar. The bar means average. x means it comes from some domain x, it's a whole bunch of scores, a whole bunch of x scores. Um, or a population, notice it's a mu, right, Greek letter, um, same thing. If you see a mu, that's the mean of a population. If you see x bar, that's the mean of a sample. And that's fairly standard, again, in the field. Um, we're going to come back to this. I just want to mention right here while we're on it, that the mean of a population is typically the best guess for any given score in that population. Right, so if you knew nothing else, you knew some population was more or less normally distributed, you didn't know anything else about the population, and I told you I'm going to pick a score. Out of that population, I want you to guess what you think that score is going to be. In general, your best guess is going to be the mean. It's not always true. If the distribution is funky, it may not be true. But generally speaking, your best guess without any further information is the mean. And when I say best guess, what I mean is, on average, you're going to have the least amount of error. Does that make sense? OK. Similarly. The mean of a sample is the best guess for the mean of the population it comes from. So let's say you don't know the average IQ of Americans. You take some subset you think is a representative sample. You find out the mean of that sample is 100. Your best guess for the mean of the population is also 100. Right? Does that make sense? It's called the maximum likelihood estimate. Um, again, I mention this now because it's going to come up later when we start to get deeper into the actual inferential statistics. It becomes important. The median is just the value that divides the distribution into two equal sized pieces. So if you take every single number, you line them up. You take the middle one, or if there's two middle ones because there's an even number, you divide them in half. 
right? Makes sense. You can probably familiar with that. Mo is just the most common number in distribution. Um, importantly, if you go back to the normal distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode are all the same. When the mean, the median, and the mode are not the same, you have various types of violations of normality, right? Like if you have a big skewed distribution, your median and your and your mean are going to be quite separate. Is that a hard fast rule that if I mean if you if they're off just by a little bitty bit, say they're not normal? If they're off, it's not normal, but it depends on right since. Excuse me, since nothing's ever actually normal, right. it depends on sort of how big that difference is. Okay. okay, so the second major type of descriptive statistics that you're probably familiar with um, already, but we're going to go over, is measures of dispersion. Measures of dispersion is just how spread out the data are. Right? So I could tell you the mean, but you could have a mean of 100 and not be spread out at all. So everyone's either at 101 or 102, somewhere in that range, or it could be hugely spread out. The mean could be 100, but a lot of scores are 50, a lot of them are 200, you just don't know, right? So dispersion tells us sort of how spread out the curve is. Um, the first measure of dispersion, it's not the most conceptually transparent one, but the most conceptually transparent one is derived from this. I'm going to introduce it first and we're going to come back. Um, variance is just a measure of how spread out scores are in a distribution. This is the formula for it right here. And you'll notice what you're doing is you're taking each individual score x you're subtracting it from the mean. So you're looking at how far off of the mean is every single score. So if it, you get 102 and the mean is 100, that difference is going to be 2, right? And then you square them all and you sum them all together, right? So you take all of these distances, you square them, and then you sum them, and then you divide by the number of scores that you see in the population, right? Or the number of scores that you're summing over. The square root of that is the standard deviation. Standard deviation is a lot more conceptually transparent. And you should think of the standard deviation more or less as the average amount that scores vary from the mean. It's not a technically rigorous definition, um, but conceptually, that's basically what it is, right? On average, scores are about 10 off. So if I were to guess the mean, on average, I would be 10 off. That's one way to sort of think about it. It's not um, as precise, maybe, as it could be. Um, but that's the easiest way to sort of deal with these. Um, standard deviation is just square root of variance. So you just take that thing you have up above and you square root it. Right? One way of thinking about this is you squared it to get rid of the sign so that negatives became positive, and then you square root it to get back to where you started, right? Square it, you get rid of the sign, square root it, you're back to the value you originally had. And then you're dividing by n, which if you think about it, the mean is just all the scores added up divided by the number of scores, right? This is roughly all the different scores added up divided by the number of them, right? Sort of like the average amount that they're going to vary. Yeah? So the larger your standard deviation, does that mean that there's a problem with the data? Or? That's a good question. It depends. It depends. Um, basically, all that means is that it's more spread out. Okay. It could be a problem. For example, if you had a flat distribution, that would be a pretty bad violation of normality that would actually affect our statistics. And you expect a bigger standard deviation then than if it was a normal distribution. So there aren't hard and fast rules where you can say anything sort of concretely and generally about that. But it would be something you might want to worry about if it was unexpectedly huge. Um, and there are big problems in some of the inferential statistics. We're not going to get into it today. Um, but just make you aware of it if you have samples that have different variances. So you're trying to compare two samples, and one variance is massive and the other is very small. It causes a lot of problems with inferential statistics. So it's a good question. All right, everyone's on board. I know, again, I know this is probably a lot of review for you guys, but. I have a question. Sure. Why do we use the um, location for the population one? In fact, we always calculate for the um, just for the one population one. Um, yeah. Why do we use that one? The sample? The sample, yeah. Like, like here, you know, you use the population location. Why do you, you actually never work with the population one? Right, right. That's a, that's a great question. We're going to come back to that. Actually, that's a fantastic question. The reason I have it here in terms of population is because it's the clearest, easiest way to think about it. And we want to know about the population. So as we start moving away from it, as we're sampling and doing these other things, essentially we're going to keep coming back and trying to estimate this value. Okay. So when we calculate it for a sample, the formula is slightly different than that. And the reason is what you're trying to do in the same way that the mean of a sample is the best estimate for the population. The, pop, the, the sample standard deviation calculated for a sample, which is slightly different, 
is your best estimate for the population standard deviation. But the population standard deviation is much more transparent what's going on. Does that answer the question? Yes. Cool. And that's, by the way, um, that's how we're going to frame as we build up through the statistics. Essentially, you're just going to know less and less about your population. So you're going to start off knowing all these wonderful things about the population, and I'm going to keep pulling away pieces of information. And the statistics change because we have to keep estimating different pieces. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. We'll, we'll come back to that. That's a great question, though. Um, okay, inferential statistics. So these are the two major classes. That you have descriptives where you're basically just describing things. If you're dealing with a population, you just use descriptive statistics. You can just say, we know what the mean of that class was, we know what their standard deviation was, we know what the mean of that class was and their standard deviation, and you can just see that they're different. You don't need to do anything else. You can just look and say, we know they're different. You can see it. We have everyone there. You can, you can just look at it, right? However, if you're trying to compare samples or compare samples to populations, you need to use inferential statistics. And what inferential statistics do is more or less just give you faith that observed differences that you see are robust, that they actually would generalize. So let's say you pull two samples that are different, right? You can see that their means are different. But the real question you want to know is, are the populations that you pulled these samples from different, right? And what the inferentials allow you to do is say, how robust is that difference I see in the samples in terms of the populations themselves? Does that make sense? So we're all sort of thinking about descriptives. And inferentials just give us sort of the, the, the spine to the descriptive for our samples. Does that make sense? Cool. OK. Um, these are used when someone wants to do more than just describe something, right? Because they're inferential. They're used to make inferences about populations from samples. Again, very straightforward mathematical wording. I love math and science because you can not know the answer, and you can make a guess, and you're usually right because they name it exactly what it is. Um, so inferential statistics are just about making inferences about populations from samples, more or less the process I was just discussing. The populations can be real. All Harvard students, all the people in this classroom, those are real defined populations. We could count them. We could say, oh, there's 2,003 of them, right? Or they can be hypothetical. For example, all depressed people that take Prozac, right? If you were to try and define that population, even if you could sort of freeze the world, you'd be hard pressed to do it, right? You'd, you'd have these sort of weird, fuzzy boundaries of this person's kind of depressed, but not really depressed. Do I stick them in that group? Do I stick them in this group? Importantly, it doesn't matter for the statistics, but it does matter conceptually in terms of how you think about it. That they can be hypothetical populations, that's not a problem. They don't actually have to exist somewhere out in the world, right? I know it's a little bit abstract probably right now, but we're going to come back to that um, because it's really important for the basic logic of how inferential statistics work. But they don't have to be real populations. Um, Usually in research, we want to know about populations, but we can only measure samples, going back to that second slide. Right? All we can do is take a sample out. We've got finite time and resources. Sometimes it's just impossible. Sometimes the population itself isn't very well defined, like I was just saying. Um, so we take samples, we measure samples, and inferential statistics tell us if what we observe about the samples actually generalizes to these populations that we're pulling them from. Because right? you can imagine you could have some population, and you could pull two samples out of it, and they could be indistinguishable, right? But just by random sampling error, they're, you're going to get differences. You're always going to get differences. And what inferential statistics allows to do is say whether or not those differences are meaningful at the higher level, right? Does that make sense? Okay. 